The scariest experience I ever had in a forest was when I was about 14 years old. I was the only daughter of my parents and enjoyed a lot of love from them. That incident changed my life completely. I live with my parents in a populated town area with all facilities. My father was working as a bank manager in the main town area. My father was earning enough for us. We also had a piece of land and our farmhouse was there. We often used to go there during my vacations. Our farmhouse was covered with wood all around. There were a few more farmhouses there, but each one was spaced out from one another. Like always, my vacation arrived, and again, my family decided to go to our farmhouse. We packed our stuff and started our trip to our farmhouse. I was a little more excited than my parents because that was one of my favorite places. I used to roam around in the woods late at night without worrying about anything. The whole day was very exhausting for us, so we all reached there and slept as soon as we had our snacks. Around 9 p.m., I woke up. I went out and had a look at the woods. I was fond of that silence. Also, I remember my dad and I had constructed a wood house that was a little deep into the woods. That night, I don't know what got into me, but I was missing our little wood house. My parents were still asleep and there was no one to accompany me, so I decided to walk alone. I started walking into the woods. Since I had gone there some more times before with my dad, I knew the route. I kept on walking in the same direction until I reached there. It was built a little high from the ground over two crossed branches. I climbed up there and went in. It was completely filled with dust and spider webs as no one ever came here after we left. I cleaned the sleeping bench which my dad and I had constructed to lie down for some time and lay there. I stayed there for about half an hour and kept on thinking about the memories I had at that place with my dad and grandpa also when he was alive. I was lying there alone, not having any fear at all. All of a sudden, I heard some noise. I got up from the bench and sat down. I cleared my mind and focused on the noise. At first, it felt like some small-sized animal roaming here and there, but within a few seconds, that noise turned out to be like footsteps. I was also getting some smoking smell. I understood that someone had sneaked into the woods without our permission. I went to the window and peeped through it. I saw a man who was dressed like a prisoner and was having a rod covered in blood. Thanks to the full moon light, I was able to see almost every detail, even if it was dark outside. His clothes were torn from several places and he was breathing heavily. All of a sudden, he got furious and started striking the rod against the trees in front of him. I got a little scared after watching his ferocity. That time, I knew I was in great danger, and if he would find that I was here, then he would definitely kill me to lose his rage. I sat there in the corner and covered my mouth with my hands so that he couldn't even hear me breathing. I was completely frightened and was shaking from head to toe. He started walking ahead, and I started thinking about whether I should stay or run from there. At first, I thought that I should stay hidden here in the wood house, but something in my brain told me to run, and run as fast as I could or I may never make it out of those woods. I peeped again through the window and ensured that he was not around me, and I climbed down and started to run, but I knew whoever he was might be nearby, so I tried to run as quietly as possible. Somehow. I was trying to calm myself from panicking, but I knew that inside I was panicking a lot. I kept turning and looking over my shoulder and didn't stop. At some point, I felt like I was being pursued, but at that point, I booked it out of there. Thankfully, I made it to my farmhouse where my parents were. I knew I was safe there, so I just sat on my door and began to think, who in the world was that man and how did he reach here? The most important question that I was asking myself was why was he dressed like a prisoner? But there was no one who could have answered me. I had been in those woods several times before exploring into the woods without any fear, but this time was different. I couldn't think what would have happened to me if he had seen me there. After that, I went to my room and slept. The next morning, I woke up a little late. My parents were already awake and were having their morning tea when I reached there. They asked me to join them, and I sat in front of the TV. My dad was swiping across the news channels, and suddenly, we saw familiar news. It was a piece of news from our woods. The headlines of the news were that a dangerous escaped convict was on loose, and that convict was with me in the woods. 
That was where the authorities had pinpointed him, and at that time, I was in the very section of the woods where he was, and even, I encountered him with my very own eyes. Whatever the matter was, I was just happy that I listened to my gut feeling and ran from there. Who knows if he would have hurt me, or killed me, but I am glad that I was safe and sound and with my parents. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. Now I have a story to share that has really traumatized me for quite a while now, and I feel this is a good place to share it. So I'm from New Zealand, and over there we have the odd missing person or scary murder case, but it's otherwise safe here and not much goes on. I mean that in a way that as a 19 year old girl I feel comfortable to walk the streets at night or go on hikes alone, and everyone looks out for one another generally. This happened in the summer of 2019, and my boyfriend and I were headed out on a picnic date to a spot we had visited many times before, called Karakariki Track. It's at the end of a very long, windy and rural farm road, off of the state highway, so you drive for about 15 to 20 minutes from the main road down a long farm stretch, and at the end is a large cul-de-sac and a massive surrounding farm. The owners of the farm have left the land kind of open to the public, as a reserve, because there are native trees and other things, and because about a 15 minute walk from the cul-de-sac car park, there's a small waterfall you can go swimming in. The track is really popular, as it's one of the closest swimming spots to the nearest city, which is Hamilton, and it's really scenic and beautiful. You can cross footbridges and pass by creek beds, etc and the farmers still go through every now and then to do their work, but there are fenced off areas that the public can't enter to, as they still actively work the land. So this particular day my boyfriend and I were really happy, because the parking lot was empty and it was a super hot summer's day, which was really rare. We saw the farmer crossing with his cows through the gate on a quad as we arrived, and he smiled and waved at us. He was an older man, and we had spoken before as we were regular visitors. So we set off towards the waterfall, and crossed one footbridge and passed through a big paddock of cows. Now the track is quite narrow, and the creek is right next to it down a bank, so you have to be careful. We saw the waterfall, decided against swimming as we had no towels, and headed back towards the car park. On our way back we decided to go down a little bit of a steep gravel off-ramp from the track, that led to a more private tree-covered area right by the creek. We were kissing and whatnot, and I was laying on my tummy, reading a book, as my boyfriend was sitting up playing on his phone, rubbing my back and playing with my hair. We were there for about ten minutes, before I turned and glanced up the gravel path. Way up even further on a hill through one of the farmer's gates, I saw a big man on a quad bike who I didn't recognize as one of the farmers as there's only an old couple who work the land. But he was just sitting there, staring at my boyfriend and I. I don't even want to think about how long he had been there before we'd noticed, so I told my boyfriend what I could see, making him turn to look too. As soon as the guy saw we were both looking at him, he opened the gate and started heading down towards us. We immediately got up to leave, as we didn't want to have to have a conversation with a farmer about us getting freaky on his land, which is what we both assumed would happen. But it was so much worse. This guy came down the gravel track and ran his quad right through the creek. He then left it there running in the water and got off. He was talking to himself, saying things along the lines of, Ah, I messed my quad and I've damaged my engine over and over, before he even got anywhere near us. My boyfriend and I were gathering our things to leave at this point, when he began to head towards us. He didn't even make small talk, which was really strange, because he went straight into saying, Have you guys seen any fish? I'm looking for some fish to kill. My boyfriend told the guy that there was no fish in the creek as it's fresh water, and that he was probably best off to catch some eel. This sent him into a fit, and he said, I don't want no effing eel. I want to kill some fish. 
I had made it a point not to look the guy in the eyes, as I didn't want to draw the conversation towards myself, because I was already extremely freaked out, and didn't want him to notice. My boyfriend was much more of the calm and strong one when it came to stuff like this. But for a second I did look at the guy, and I thought it looked like his face was slightly deformed. I thought maybe Bell's palsy. As I work in aged care, I've seen it a bit and it looked similar. I bent down to tie my shoelace, and as I stood back up, that's when I noticed a pistol on this man's waist. Now listen to me closely. This is the first and last time in my entire life I have ever seen a real-life gun, as it's incredibly hard to get a firearm in New Zealand, especially after the regulations following the mass shooting in Christchurch. And not only that, he had one pistol on his belt and was waving another one about in his hand as he talked to my boyfriend about wanting to kill some fish. He was aiming it down to the creek every now and again, then swinging it around on his finger. My boyfriend gave me this stern look, and stern is the best word for it, because the look spoke a million words to me in that moment, and he nodded his head towards the gravel hill, leading back to the track. I grabbed the two bags we had, fake checked my phone and told the man that our family were waiting for us back at the car park. He completely ignored what I had said though and instead said, That's a cool hat you've got on or something along those lines that were completely irrelevant. So I dismissed myself, said goodbye and made my way to the hill. In my mind I didn't want to look back and see that my boyfriend had been shot and then a gun at my own head. I knew that our best bet was me getting up this hill onto the narrow path where he couldn't ride his quad and sprint towards the farmer's house. As I was walking up the hill this guy said to my boyfriend, That's a really pretty girl you've got there. It was like all the intentions of his that I didn't want to believe were just then confirmed. I actually felt like I was going to die. My boyfriend, though, said a quick, Thank you, we'll be off now, and headed up the hill with me. The guy kept talking, though, like the conversation hadn't ended, even as we headed away. He just stood there, gun in hand, and watched us leave. As soon as we were around the corner, we sprinted all the way back to the car park, where there were over ten empty gun shells. We hadn't noticed this before. We had run into two girls in bikinis arriving at the spot, and informed them about the guy and everything that had just happened, so they got in their cars and left immediately. We tried to go to the farmer's house to ask if he knew the guy, as we'd never seen him on the land before. But they weren't home anymore, and as for the gun... It's still really freaky to me, as I'd never seen one before. But the pistols the guy had looked quite old and rusty, and when we discussed the incident on the way home, my boyfriend suggested they were probably handed down to him from someone else. This incident has stuck with me for the past few years, and my boyfriend and I have not been able to return to that spot again, which really sucks, because that's where we had our first date, and it meant a lot to us. I had to drive past the road leading to the track for about a year too, as I commuted between towns, and it always made me feel sick. I could have lost my life or my partner that day, or so much worse, and I'm always extremely grateful that my boyfriend is the man that he is, and was able to steer the guy away from us for us to leave. To communicate to me through movement to tell me what to do in my freaked out state too. He told me afterwards that he was ready to die if he had to because knowing the guy had been watching us beforehand and complimented me in the way that he did, it was clear that he could have had some scary intentions. It's also made me way more fearful now to travel in the bush alone, which I've done my whole life. Back when I was pursuing my PhD in zoology at the UL Lafayette, I chose to write my thesis on the life cycle of biology of the alligator snapping turtle. This meant I spent an awful lot of time out at the Atchafalaya National Wildlife Refuge, a one million and a half acre area of hardwood swamps, lakes, and bayous about 30 miles west of Baton Rouge. It's a truly beautiful and awe-inspiring place, but it's wild. One of those areas out in the country that has barely been conquered by humanity. And coming from Chicago, 
I'd never seen anything quite like it. But as much as I had come to love Achafalaya, I had one of the worst experiences of my entire life whilst lost in the swamps there, an incident so intensely terrifying that I had to put my studies on pause for a matter of months in order to recover. I've decided to write down what I went through as a form of cognitive behavioral therapy in the hopes that it will help me deal with some of the unresolved traumas that followed me out of the swamps. Whether or not it will actually help, I can't tell just yet, but I sincerely hope it does, as frankly, I've been unable to be completely happy or content in myself since it happened. So without further ado, this is my story. It all started the morning my research partner and I were supposed to drive out to Achafalaya for a long day of study and observation. The weather had been absolutely abominable over the previous few weeks and we picked a time during what appeared to be a brief break in the rainy season. It might be the only period for weeks where it would be feasible to undertake such a research trip, but in the morning we were due to depart, I awoke to a text message saying he was feeling severely under the weather. He apologized, but told me that he wouldn't be able to accompany me. I was disappointed in the extreme, but like I said, the following few days looked like they would be the only time I'd be able to get a sizable chunk of research completed. So as foolish as it was, I loaded up my gear into my car and drove out into the swamps, alone. I drove out to the small town of Plaquemine, just on the edge of Achafalaya, parking up near a small mom and pop joint to get some griots and grits before my hike into the swamps. I was in a pretty bad mood marching in there alone and I had to carry a little extra equipment since I couldn't spread the load with my research partner. This made the walk out to my preferred observation spot much more tiring than usual. I mean, it's crazy how just a little extra weight can make a long hike like that seem harder. But anyway, I'm on my way out to a place called Upper Flat, a big stretch of water near Little Tensa Bayou, when all of a sudden, I start realizing that I don't recognize any of the terrain. This was weird, as I'd made this journey like at least 50 times before, too many to really keep track of, but... I figured I've only strayed just a little off course and I could find my way back onto my regular trail in no time. It was just a case of finding out which direction I'd move off in and making the appropriate course correction. Only when I get my compass out, I see the little needle spinning around wildly, like whirling around in a circle like it was being propelled by something. I give it a little tap, shaking it up, but it carries on doing exactly the same thing. It's not like it was a cheap compass either. It was a Sunto KB-14 and there's some of the best compasses on the market. That one in particular sent me back almost 200 bucks, so I fall back on the compass on my iPhone which is even less reliable but works off a of GPS as opposed to the Earth's natural magnetic forces. But again, not only does it refuse to calibrate, but I realize I have absolutely no bars on my phone either. That was definitely not normal. The cell reception isn't the best out there but I always get something, even if it's just a single bar to send texts. I'm a little worried by that point as I've basically got no method of reaching the outside world if something goes wrong, but it's either push on and get my day's research done, or walk back the way I came and face messing up my entire thesis, and I don't even know if the way I came will even take me back to Plaquemine by that point. So I foolishly decide it would be better to push on as opposed to turn back one of the single biggest mistakes of my life. So I'm walking for like another hour or so, hopelessly lost in a place I somehow barely recognize when I begin to smell smoke coming through the trees. I figured it's some campers or hunters out there which would be highly unusual for the wet season but at least they'd be able to point me back in the direction of Upper Flat. I follow my nose as the smoky smell gets more and more intense until I start to see the smoke itself wafting through the trees. That's also about the time I begin to hear the slow, rhythmic sounds of a banjo being plucked, just out of sight. It's not some jolly Cajun tune, either. The sounds are discordant, ominous even, and the hairs on the back of my neck begin to stand on end as I finally begin to see this little wooden shack coming into view. I can see the campfire by that point, and the sounds of the banjo are floating out of the small window in the shack. I'm nervous but I speak up anyway, calling out hello and asking if anyone is home, even though I knew well that there is. I was just trying to be polite, you know. 
This angry-looking face appears in the window in an instant, a face I'll never forget. This guy's skin looked like leather, all wrinkled and cracked while the darkest eyes I'd ever seen started around from sunken eye sockets. He had a beard and mustache, but it was all dark, ratty, patchy hair that made him look more like a kind of vermin than a man. There was some rustling from inside before the guy stumbled out from the shack's door, staring at me from the wooden steps. I apologized for my intrusion, then asked him if he knew which direction I could find Upper Flat. He didn't say a word at first, just carried on staring at me like I was somewhere I didn't belong, which I suppose was exactly the case. I then took to reassuring him that I didn't want to take up any of his time, that I was a little lost and all I wanted was to find my way back towards Little Tensa. Petit Tensa? He replied in a drawl of Cajun French. Uh, oui. Parlez-vous anglais? I had picked up a little French since moving to Louisiana for school, but I'm not about to pretend it was any good. The man just shook his head and then said something that sounded like a question that included the word traiteur. For those of you that don't know, in Louisiana, a traiteur is what they call someone who practices so-called faith healing and whose primary method of treatment involves what's known on as kind of a laying on of hands, so to speak. An important part of Creole and Cajun folk religion, the traiteur combines Catholic prayer, medicinal remedies, and occasionally voodoo rituals. Or at least I thought they did. I genuinely didn't think that there were any traiteurs left, assuming the practice had long died out, yet apparently not. Uh, traiteur cum, uh, voodoo? No? I asked with a chuckle in my terrible French, trying to be as disarming as possible as to not irritate the man any further. He didn't laugh. He didn't smile. He just got mad. Really, really mad. He started growling things in French I didn't understand, pointing at me accusatorily as he seemed to get angrier and angrier. I started to back off slowly at that point, hands raised in the air as if to say, I don't want any trouble. But somehow that just makes him even more irate. And then he's sort of apoplectic with rage as he pulls this huge gator jawbone knife from behind his back and starts pointing it directly at me. A knife on its own would have been intimidating enough, but seeing the blunted alligator teeth that made up the handle, Jesus, that's just about scared the life out of me. I thought once I was out of there I'd be okay, but as I'm walking back through the forest, pretty shaken up, he starts screaming in French and whistling. Only when I look over my shoulder just to make sure he's not about to give chase, I notice something that makes my blood run cold. He's not screaming at my back. He's not whistling at me either. He's screaming and whistling into the forest. It didn't quite hit me at first. I just peered over the back of my shoulder wondering what he was doing, but then I realized he was calling others, telling them there was an intruder or whatever. I tried to move as quickly as I could without running, don't get me wrong. I was absolutely terrified, but the bayou is not a place to go blindly sprinting among the greenery. Aside from gators and occasional cougar sightings, Louisiana is home to the cottonmouth snake. Although it's not outright deadly, their venom contains an anticoagulant, meaning the wound won't clot. Cottonmouth bites have been known to be fatal and without treatment certainly require amputation. So. I'm sort of jogging and bounding my way from the shack as fast as I can, keeping my eyes on the ground so I don't get myself bitten. I go for about 20 minutes or so until I'm happy I'm far enough away from that angry Cajun to resume my walking pace. I felt exhaustion setting in at that point too. I'm sweating through my clothes and I am completely and utterly lost. My compass and phone still aren't working at all and the further I walk, the more I'm panicking that I'm not going to be able to get out of the swamps by sundown in which case I would be really screwed. But just as I'm starting to feel relatively safe, I hear something like a twig snapping behind me before I get this horrible feeling in my gut like someone is actually following me. I do a quick 360, making sure I can't see anyone, which I don't. The bayou seemed as still and quiet as ever, yet the feeling didn't abate. I'm still convinced that someone is out there just beyond my vision, watching me with unseen eyes. 
I start moving more quickly again, bounding through the trees until I'm almost certain I can hear the sounds of a car driving in the distance. I was close to road, I was sure of it. But right as I start to move off in the direction of the sound, someone steps out from a tree just to the side of me. They were dressed in all black, bare-chested with red-brown skin that was riddled with strange-looking tattoos. Over their face was a mask that looked an awful lot like the front section of a human skull, and in their hand was a huge black blade of some kind. To this day, I have never seen anything as completely and utterly terrifying as whoever or whatever walked out from behind that tree. Whether or not they intended to do me harm or just scare me out of the area, I can't really say for certain. But I sure didn't want to wait to find out. I forgot about the cotton mouths and just ran as fast as I could, sprinting through the trees as I heard the guy following me. It was horrifying. I could hear him panting just a few meters behind me, the whole way until I burst through this thick patch of bushes and onto the highway behind it. I ran out in front of a car which almost smashed into me, honking its horn with the driver going crazy. I ran around to the guy's driver's window and begged him to let me in. At first he told me to screw off and almost drove off on me. But I begged the guy. I mean, I really begged. And I don't know if it was how haggard I looked or if it was the genuine terror in my voice, but eventually he agreed to let me in. I told him what went back down in that bayou and I asked him if he'd ever seen or heard anything like that. He told me no, but also mentioned that he knew way better than to be walking around the bayou on his own like that and that I was an idiot for doing it. He was kind enough to drive me back over to Plaquemine to where my car was parked, and I thanked him profusely for potentially saving my life. I offered him some gas money, but he told me no, that there was no way he was about to take money off of me for just doing the right thing. That's something I never forgot about Louisiana, just how kind and generous people could be. How the whole thing about southern hospitality was very, very true. But I've also never forgotten about that man in the bone mask. The man who haunted my nightmares for months after, and almost ruined my whole time at college since, like I said, I had to put my studies on pause just to get over what I'd seen out there. So please, don't ever go walking into the bayous of Louisiana alone, because there are people out there that are seriously averse to the intrusion of outsiders. <laughs>